Welcome back you guys, my name is Joe Ellis and I'm back today with you guys to talk about something that I just think is amazing and it's a feature that just makes you feel like a magician with an Olympus camera. One of the reasons that I got um, into Olympus cameras and one of the reasons I shoot them is because they have so many innovative features. I just feel like on the feature front Olympus is really pushing the envelope to give photographers as many tools as they possibly can. And one of the tools that is just outstanding and is so much fun to play with and makes such amazing images is called Live Composite. So what is Live Composite? Um, briefly, I would just describe it as a way for you to paint with light in a way that's much easier and um, more controlled than you could with a regular old DSLR. Uh, the mechanics of it are this. You take one exposure for your background, so it's like a normal photo of a scene that you like. And then you trip a shutter the second time, and in live composite, now only new light will be recorded onto the sensor. So whether it's you're waiting for cars to come by and create streaks of lights with their headlights, you're waiting for a burst of lightning to come out of the sky, you're shooting fireworks and waiting for them to pop off in the background, Whatever light is introduced to the scene after the first exposure is the only light that is recorded on top of your original exposure. So uh, <clears throat> I'm not gonna demonstrate all those different <laughs> um, you know, genres of using live composite because um, you know, I'm a people photographer, I'm a portrait photographer, a wedding photographer, a dad. And so I wanna talk about just specifically giving you guys some tips on shooting live composite images with people in them. Um, but first I just want to talk about a few of the basics to how you get started. So you're going to need a couple of things to do a live composite image. You're going to need a way to stabilize your camera so it doesn't move. So, tripod. <laughs> um, you're going to need some kind of light in your scene that you want to play with. Now like I said, that could be some kind of ambient light like car lights or lightning or whatnot. But probably the easiest way to get started is just to use a flashlight. Like this little guy here. And then of course you're going to need your camera. And then my other uh, piece of advice is to go ahead and use your phone as a way to trigger your camera. That way you can be away from the camera and the tripod and trigger the camera and then start your light painting from wherever you want to be. So those are the kind of the key components that you're going to have to have. Now, um, one tip I have is that um, when you um, use your phone to trigger your camera, there's a couple of different modes that you can be in. And I find one of them to be a lot more useful when I'm working and I want to keep it simple. Um, so the first thing you'll have to do is turn on the Wi-Fi on your camera. And that's easy enough to do. It's in the playback menu, or you can find it right on the screen um, as you're looking at an image. So if I turn this on and hit play, I can hit Wi-Fi right here on the top of the screen, or I can go into menu, and then I can go to the playback menu, and then go to connection to smartphone. So I'll do that now, Wi-Fi starting, and then I'll just turn my phone on and I'll go to Wi-Fi. I have an iPhone, so this takes me another second. I did get a great tip um, from one of my uh, viewers saying that if you have an Android phone, you can set preferential Wi-Fi for your camera so that when the camera's Wi-Fi turns on, it will switch to that Wi-Fi signal anytime that it comes on, which is awesome, but I don't know how to do that on, a, on an Apple phone. So. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and connect to my EM1 Mark II. And then, you, of course, you'll have to download and install the OI Share app, which I highly recommend everybody does. Um, and that's right here. And so on the screen, the top menu item is called Remote Control, right? But the thing I want you to check first is by going to the gear icon on the top right-hand corner of the screen, you'll see the Remote Control options. And there's two uh, modes you can be in when you're using your phone to trigger your camera. One is called remote shutter and the other one is called live view. I really find remote shutter to be a much more useful tool for me when I'm out working in the field. Um, this will vary by genre of photography greatly because in live view you actually get to look on your phone and see what the camera is seeing. So if you need to put it up above your head for example and see what the camera is seeing and set the um, composition of your image and that kind of thing, you can totally do that from the live view setting. But if you can be behind your camera and set everything up and then you just want the uh, phone to trigger the camera for, you know, whether you don't want it to be shaking or you want to be away from the camera for whatever reason, then um, this remote shutter option is just awesome. 
So once you have that set, um, you would go to row control. And in my case, all you get in that scenario <clears throat> is a big trigger button. It's just a boom, push it once to fire the camera, push it again to fire it again, or whatever you want. Here's the two things I love about that. Number one, it's kind of idiot proof. I maybe this is three things. Two, um, you can still use your camera to set up everything that you need to set up, like focus and, um, you know, or live composite or whatever it is. You can get behind the camera, and make all the adjustments that you want. If you're in the live view setting, then you have to make all those adjustments from the phone. <clears throat> and the third reason I like it is that if you want to run behind your camera to check the uh, final image, you can do that with this mode. Uh, just by going behind the camera and pressing play. If you're in the live view mode, you have to disconnect or use the phone screen to review images. And a lot of the times when that's transferring back and forth, um, that can take time and it's just not nearly as quick as running behind the camera to check the, check the exposures. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this off for a second. That is um, kind of how I work with that and I think it's great. So. We have all the tools, we have the camera set up, so we have the remote trigger ready. So here's the cadence of events after that. So you're going to um, set your base exposure, right? First you're gonna figure that out. So for me, what I'll do is, um, I generally keep the ISO really low for these because they're usually, um, you know, no need for me a long exposure anyway to be at some super high ISO. But so let's say we're at ISO 200 and I'm looking at like a downtown night uh, escape that I'm going to show you guys in a minute. I would figure out that the base exposure for the way I want the city to turn out in the background would be like F8 at two seconds. Okay. Then I will turn my camera into live composite mode. And I will, and the way you do that is that you go to the shutter speeds of the camera. <laughs> I'll just show you if you guys can see this on the top screen here. Um, just below, you know, you just go 15 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 seconds, and then you get to bulb mode, keep going, you get live time and live composite. Live composite's the last one. Once you're in the live composite mode there, you hit the menu button, and that will bring up a screen that lets you set the base exposure time. So you need to know kind of, or experiment with for a second, what number of seconds you want your exposure to be. So, um, you know, it could be anything really, but, I, you know, would say, let's say two seconds or something like that. Um, you can just go to two seconds like this, set okay. Now you're gonna have that F8 at two second exposure. So that you would go ahead and trip the camera and it would take that base exposure. Now the city has now been recorded on the scene, right? Now you're gonna take a second exposure. The second exposure is you're going to record any new light that happens um, for whatever duration of time you have the shutter open. So you're gonna hit the button again, the shutter will open, and now it's just open continuously recording any new light that hits the scene for as long as you want it to. So that could be, like I said, you're sitting there waiting for the um, uh, lightning to come out. <laughs> you know, like, if you've ever been sitting there waiting for lightning forever, trying to anticipate when it's gonna happen, well, you could just sit there and wait, and as soon as the lightning happens, boom, you're done. Hit the end, exposure, and you're over. But in my case, let's say um, you're experimenting, and the first thing I would experiment with is probably just a basic flashlight. So you take your base exposure, downtown city skyline, then you walk into the scene and you um, turn the flashlight on, right? No light is really hitting you because you're pretty dark. You're silhouetted against the, against the background. Um, and you start moving the flashlight around in the scene. Now it's going to record a trail of light um, because it sees the flashlight and where it's been and it just creates those streaks. So you could write something, you could draw a picture, you could just put light in various parts of the frame. Whatever you want it to be, you can be as creative as you want. Um, and then when you're done putting all new light in your scene or recording any new light that happened, you just hit the button again on your phone and boom, the exposure is over. And now you have a composite image. You have all the new light you recorded and then you have the background of the first exposure that you made. The really cool thing is that back in the day when we did this and it was just one, let's say six or eight second exposure, um, you know, if you let the shutter open for more than six or eight seconds, the downtown city skyline would keep getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter because more and more light was hitting the sensor as time went on. With this mode, the background exposure is set. It will never change. So your city's always gonna look amazing. And then the only lights recorded after that is just the new light that you bring in. So it makes it so much easier to kind of do these light painting photos. So a um, couple of tips um, 
Number one, you want to go ahead and wear dark clothing if at all possible when you're being a light painter. And the reason for that is that if you stand still for too long in the photo and some kind of ambient light from a street light even a block away or whatever um, sees you and puts a, just a tiny bit of light on you, if you stand still that's going to get recorded. If you're moving then it probably won't get recorded. And if you're wearing black it minimizes all of that. So don't stand still for too long if you can help it or hide behind something and try and wear as dark a clothing as possible. And the second thing is that anything that you can dream up that makes light can be used in light painting. Um, for the picture I'm going to show you guys in a minute, I actually made a contraption that I found at Home Depot. And that is this thing. I was watching a tutorial while I was on spring break with my kids of a guy who does light painting and he suggested buying this. I'll put his link in the description below. His name is Eric Paré and he does a ton of really great light painting and I think if he had an Olympus camera he would make his life a lot easier. But the way this works is that um, this is a two dollar tube that I found that holds um, you know those fluorescent light bulbs to protect them. Um, it's made of plastic so it's totally durable and on the end I have two tiny flashlights just like this one They've been gaff taped into it. And then on the inside of the tube, I actually put some diffusion material so that the light would be more even throughout the tube while I'm uh, using it. So, you know, if you make a run to Home Depot, you could literally find anything at all that emits light could be a light painting tool for you. So have some fun with this if it's the first time you've ever tried it. You can start with a flashlight and you can move on to anything you can dream up. Okay, so those are the basics of live composite, but I wanted to talk to you guys in the computer, uh, with the computer and Photoshop to kind of show you a few things that are very specific about using this technique when you're photographing people, because there's a couple little tricks that really help out. So let's jump to Photoshop. Okay, so a few tips on you guys, for you guys on how to make an image like this one, at least from my perspective. Um, if you are working with a kind of an epic background like this one, the first thing I would tell you is that it's it's helpful to arrive early and to shoot through the blue hour until you find that perfect moment where there's a great balance of light in the sky and light from the city that gives you the pre prettiest possible background plate. So in this case, we arrived about mm, 20 minutes before sunset, and I set up and kind of waited for the light to kind of reach a point where I thought it was the most beautiful, and there was a nice balance. Um, the second tip I have for you when you're working with people is you really want to pick a strong pose. Um, you know, you need something that they're going to be able to hold for a couple of seconds and that um, will allow you to work with the light painting and not have any uh, too much blurriness in the frame. You can see right here on her uh, dress that there is a little bit of wind blowing and you're going to get a little bit of movement in that case. Um, now there is a little bit of light hitting them, you know, extra light hitting them during the moment that we're making these exposures, so I'm fighting that. If you had a perfect silhouette situation, then you, of course, wouldn't need to worry about it because when there's no light on them, nothing would be being recorded. So pick a strong pose. Um, the next thing I would tell you is that uh, work with that remote uh, in your hand from the phone so that you can minimize the amount of time that they're having to hold still. Uh, you can, in if you're working with still lifes, just walk back and forth and take as long as you want in live composite to do your light painting. But in my case, I did need them uh, to hold still because I didn't want too much uh, movement in the frame. So I just used the, cam the phone's trigger to um, keep that time down to a minimum. Okay, the next tip I have for you is that when you're working with light painting, um, try different speeds of movement. This is really critical because the slower that you move your light, the more you time you give it to accumulate on the sensor and the brighter it will be. So you need to kind of um, you know, try and experiment a few times to figure out what sort of speed really works with the particular light that you have. Obviously, the stronger the light is, the less time it's going to need, so on and so forth. So maybe you're getting too much, maybe you're getting too little. A lot of it will have to do with the speed at which the light is moving. The next tip <laughs> is uh, if you're working with a wand like mine, it really helps to make lightsaber sounds while you're working. Hot tip. <laughs> and then um, the last thing I would tell you is that um, if you want detail in your subjects and you're working with people, I would um, add an extra light to the scene. So in this case, I actually have them holding an extra LED light behind them. And that's bouncing off of her chest and onto his face. And it's just adding a little bit of extra light to the scene. 
And so um, you could do that light from the front or from behind or from anywhere that you want. But if you add that extra light, it will kind of take that light painting sort of maybe up another level because it won't just be a silhouette. It'll actually be a portrait. So um, that's, that's kind of how I arrived on this picture, guys. I took, you know, a few dozen of these and picked one of my favorites. And I did some full circles and I did some waving back and forth. And you feel a little like an idiot while you're doing it. But it really does make a picture that's really unique and different and uh, fun for your for your clients or for your friends and family. So get out there and give it a try. Um, let me see what you guys come up with. I'd love to talk about it in the comments. And as always, I'm looking forward to the next one. Again, if you want to follow me online, my website is josephmark.com, J-O-S-E-P-H-M-A-R-K. And my Instagram is josephmarkphoto. So that's josephmarkphoto. Thanks, you guys. Talk to you soon. Bye.